The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is Let Automation Play the Test <clears throat> excuse me. Let Automation Play the Role It Deserves. And today's presenter is Rude Tunison. If you have any questions for Rude regarding his webinar, please type them into the questions field on your control panel and I will ask these questions to Rude directly at the end of the webinar. Remember, you can, you can type your questions at any point during the course of the webinar. These slides and a recording of this webinar will be available on the Eurostar website after the webinar. You can join the conversation on Twitter at hashtag ESConfs and you can connect with us at at ESConfs. You can also connect with today's presenter, Root, at at Root Tunison. And now, let me hand you over to today's presenter, Root. Hello, Root. Hello. Now I need to click something here. Okay, so I've taken over. Oh, yeah, I just tested it. Uh, welcome to my uh, my webinar on let test automation play the role it deserves. Um, I've been in testing almost 25 years and um, I've tested all kind of stuff. Um, automation always has played uh, a minor role in that because, well, for some reason automation wasn't up to it yet. Maybe the tooling, maybe the skills, maybe the people, but lately I felt, well, kind of an urge but not only me, but together with my colleagues, we felt an urge to get test automation, well, started back on uh, on track, back on the agenda, things like that. Because this is actually how we should feel about test automation. We should be very delighted that it, yeah, that we finally are getting it to work. Because, as you know, testers are curious and curious people tend to get bored if they have to do the same stuff over and over again although it might be different circumstances but they just want to do something differently and well challenge systems and not repeat after repeat so the the main issue is actually that true success stories have not been heard i even heard um, a well-known test automation specialist speak at a conference stating, well, you know, it's still out there on the horizon somewhere. One day we will get it working. And then I thought, well, that's not how we should look at it, shouldn't we? So we started collecting ideas, uh, maybe best practices, although I should call them good practices, I do believe nowadays. And we started looking at why do things fail and not in the sense to get a blame list or uh, something like that. No, more like, okay, what should we take into account? What should we take care of once we get started with test automation? Because I do feel there is a need for test automation. It used to be a luxury, something that if you had the money and the time, you could do, but I think it is becoming something which is necessary for us as testers to survive. So. A few of them, one tool to rule them all. That's not really true, uh, you know. Uh, there might be one ring to rule them all if you uh, go to the hobbits, but in tooling, not really. Communication, that's central, isn't it? But isn't that central in any IT organization? So we started to look at those and trying to find solutions for this. And one big thing, and this might sound silly or maybe even stupid, test automation is automation of testing. So it is automation, which means that it should be fit for purpose with realistic objectives and fit for the context. So it should be achievable in the current context. I've seen beautiful tools which can do great stuff with the right people. They can do great stuff maybe not in the current situation, not in the current context you're working in. So you need to take care of that. And I think those are two essential characteristics of any good approach to test automation. 
And that's why we created, in fact, uh, what we call a roadmap, the roadmap to success, to, well, actually get test automation implemented and or approved with, uh, um, improved within your organizations. We actually have a, a name for it. We call it test improvement for automation. TI for automation. Um, and it is goal driven, not tool driven. Like one of the questions many people ask us when they meet us for the first time is, what is your tool? Um, I say, I don't know. We have so many tools we can use. And actually, we don't talk about tools. We talk about tooling because it's always a set of tools, instruments, and all kinds of software you need to get the solution working, like software. Focus on the added value of test automation. So what do we want to achieve with test automation? And we have a process for that. And as you probably already have seen, it's a bit like the Deming wheel we've all been working for. So instead of plan, act, do, check, check, do, it is plan, find out what you need to achieve, assess, find out your current context, find out how you can achieve it, find out what tools there are, what tools you need, and then start implementing it and optimizing the, the situation. That's, in fact, the idea behind it. And, well, it is based on awareness, commitment, and buy-in, which is something which is key to success. And um, although I've never seen one actually working it's like a perpetual mobile, you know, one of those devices that once it gets started, it will never stop without adding energy. Um, and it's a timeless, uh, endless activity. You need to always be aware of this. You need to always take care of the fact that you need to have awareness, commitment, and buy-in at any level, but especially at management level. Now, what is a trigger? for TI for automation, for test improvement for automation, to make test automation play the role it deserves. Uh, maybe it's because you want to achieve continuous integration. I do not see continuous integration or daily, daily builds and uh, daily deployment, continuous deployment. I do not see that working without test automation. You have to have test automation in place. And how about Agile Scrum? Well, maybe in the first initial sprints, you might be able to do everything manually, but if you want to be truly successful, especially in larger organizations, you have to have automation in place. Maybe only for unit testing, but I feel even for acceptance testing and maybe even for some end-to-end -end testing, it is necessary. Otherwise, you won't be able to develop any new functionality, add any business value in one of the sprints. So that's a trigger as well. And how about test-driven development? First, write an automated test that fails, and then write code. Automation is key here. You need to have it. But also, you might have a solution. You might already have an automated solution working, or at least well, kind of working. But you need to maintain that, and maybe you need to get it updated and upgraded to your new current situation like this robot, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I need maintenance too. A robot, an automated solution, needs maintenance too. So these are all kinds of triggers that are needed to get started in test automation. And why do I look at this? Because this might seem like, uh, yeah, hey, we know, but this is already setting your objectives and setting your goals. You have to fit within the Agile context. You have to fit within test-driven development. You have to make the current test automation solution work. So that's what you need to uh, achieve. And how do you get management commitment and support? Let, let's focus on that one. They need to set realistic goals, not like automate everything. That's unrealistic. You need to have realistic goals. Automate the unit tests within that area. Automate the acceptance tests within that area, or maybe 75%. They need to tell you what the business case is and help you monitor it. They need to provide and grant the necessary budget. They need to maybe even enable changes in software development because test automation, well, that's an automated solution that needs to work closely together with software. And software, well, might need some minor changes 
to enable more swift, more efficient, more effective test automation. So maybe the software development and maybe even the test process needs adjustments. And this is one of the things I learned and I, I, I do not prefer to, to quote people, but this is one I, uh, I, I did learn uh, in one of my uh, last projects is uh, management seemed to be committed, but they were not involved. And then uh, I was reading this book uh, from Stephen Covey, and he said, without involvement, there is no commitment. Uh, you know, in Agile they talk about chicken and pigs, you know, ham and eggs. Uh, it's kind of that. Uh, the, the management should be involved uh, and not only committed because you need to be in there. Now let's look at this roadmap. Um, first step is planning. Now usually this, this step is for some reason left out or taken very quickly. Well, I think it's maybe one of the most important steps. So, what do we want to achieve? When does management, when do the people involved feel that test automation is successful? And of course, successful usually relates to uh, better quality, better quality of test automation, better quality of test regression testing, better quality of unit testing, maybe spending less time in testing, lapse time, less cost, or maybe even cost reduction, uh, um, and then you need to find that out. You need to define that. And you need to find out what your restrictions are. Because recently I was visiting a customer and he said, well, you know, we have this new policy, open source only. So although maybe in their situation one of the commercial tools would have been the best solution there was, their policy restricted use from that tool. And what are the timelines? I mean, you have to be realistic. Uh, software automation, test automation takes time, especially once uh, if you need to select the tooling, if you need to implement an architecture and stuff like that, that's what takes time. So what are the timelines and how are they, have they been set? So um, I like the school boards uh, like goal setting, uh, make the goals specific, measurable, attainable, relevant and time bound, but also uh, realistic and achievable and they are totally different from test objectives. I'll come back to that a bit later, but it's not the same as your test objective. It's not as uh, giving advice on going live, yes or no. No, it is different. It should, however, support testing activities and, of course, development activities, the testing within development. It should not only be on the short term for this one project, but also for the long term. You need to have a vision on that and, you, of course, you need to regularly revisit and revise your targets and goals. And that's what you need to do. So, in fact, you need to have a project for test automation or maybe a team for test automation. And a business case. And uh, recently there was a presentation on there is no return on investment on test automation. Well, you know, um, it's all about wording. I think it's true there is a cost-benefit analysis and you need to look at costs and benefit not only now but also in the future. Because usually the costs are now and the benefits are in the future and maybe not even within one of the, uh, of the projects but maybe after a year, maybe after two years. It all depends on your context. And what do you need to take care of in your business case? So what problem are you solving? What are your ideas? What are the risks involved? Who, need to be, who do you need to get involved? What is the impact? Positive impact? Negative impact? Um, all that kind of stuff do you need. To, that's what you need to develop. And, you know, people usually focus on something like this. Uh, you need to invest 358 days to get test, test automation working. And this is what you will save. In the current context, they spend 154 days on testing. In the future context, just 40 days. This is regression testing. So we save a lot of money after one year or two test cycles. You're still in debt, but after two years, four cycles, you start making money. Now, this is pretty straightforward. This is tangible. People can, well, see the numbers turn black again, which is great. But the main benefit usually isn't especially in costs or in time spent on testing. It's more in, uh, we spend less time on regression test execution so we can focus on 
auto parts, new functionality, on maybe performance testing, maybe security testing, on other aspects. We can achieve continuous testing through continuous integration. And it is an opportunity to implement more releases. That's in fact one of the things we're trying to achieve with this customer. They have two releases a year because the time is limited and they hopefully, they hope to achieve at least eight releases a year because of test automation. So it's not only cost benefit but it is also the less tangible and the more you know, fluffy part of a business case which usually is even uh, better than the numbers. So what is your scope? Uh, you know, uh, automate everything, that's not, that's not great. Uh, you need to focus on a, on a certain project, on a certain part of the organization, on a certain test type, on a certain test level. You need to define that. Otherwise you might end up uh, feeling like this truck. I don't know where he's going or where they are going. I don't know if you know this, but it's not just load, it's also people on there. This sometimes feels like test automation. That's uh, projects I've seen and I've been involved in. A lot of stuff gets loaded on, oh, you can do this, oh, you can do this, oh, you can take care of that. You need to set your scope and watch the scope creep. You need to be able to get there. I'm not sure whether this truck will get there in the end, and we need to be able to get there. So setting your scope is critical to the success. Setting your scope also depends on, well, who you are. Maybe you're the supplier, this could be the internal IT organization, the internal test department that hands over stuff to the business. And usually, and that's, that's, that's the context you're working in, you get a, a document, a contract, you need to make this work. And you focus on works as designed, uh, focusing on components, maybe services, and you usually see kind of a bottom-up approach. That's why I like Lego uh, to compare it to. You like the Lego blocks, you know, and then uh, you, all you make sure of is that they, well, work as designed. You know, you can click them on, they have the right size, the right interfaces, everything works fine. But from a customer and the business perspective, you're not looking at those components. You're looking on fit for purpose. Can I take pictures with this? Because that's, in fact, the same box only now composed into one big tool. That's what you need to do. You need to be able to test that. That's end to end. Take a picture, transport it. I don't know whether this is it. I think this is still an old fashioned camera. So you need to get it out of there, to get it processed and find out whether you created beautiful pictures. It's a business process and it's usually top down. So that's also part of your scope, but also very critical input information for the success of your test automation. You need to know whether you're a supplier or a business or maybe even a combination. This is just an example. Uh, I've added it maybe uh, mainly for, for the slides, but here you can see we want to do automation because we want to start working agile. We want to fit a regression test within the agile sprints of three maybe four weeks. And we want to make sure that we reduce the time, reduce the effort needed for the current regression testing. So let's automate at least 175 of our functional test cases. And out of scope is unit testing and interface testing. And we want to, ha want to have it within three to four months. And of course, if possible, sooner. So this is your objectives. This is your scope. Haha, <laughs> nice thing. Measurements, we all love them, don't we? I know there's a lot of discussion going on about metrics. What is the added value of metrics? But I do feel that for test automation, you need to define certain measurements in line with the objectives, in line with the business case. So if your business case is, for instance, reducing the, the manual effort in regression testing, monitor that. Monitor what the, is, what the effort is now and monitor what it will be once you start automating. And it is, oh, I didn't test this re really well, test automation related. Because, you know, uh, this is what I want to pre uh, prevent from happening. Uh, I'd like to see those meaningless statistics again about the number of test cases that were automated, the number of test cases that were run successfully, the number of whatever. You need to find out what measurements tell you exactly about 
the progress of test automation and the success of test automation. So you need to be really sure that you define those measurements up front. And one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions once uh, someone told us. And I really like that because, you know, it, once you know what you're going to measure, how you're measuring it, that's really uh, key to, well, monitoring success. The roadmap. Before we start automating, let's look at the context. Let's look at the situation we're in. So, the test automation context, and this is a picture I, um, I borrowed from uh, test process improvement, in fact. But let's look at test automation. Of course, it's within the organization, within the quality policy, within the software process, and the test process. But test process improvement, for instance, focuses on the test process. But test automation, in our experiences, focuses on the test process as well as the software process. Test automation needs the software process and it needs the test process. So that's what we are, in fact, are looking for. We are looking for something that helps, supports the software process and the test process in close relation. But, you know, your context, your automating testing, um, testing is your context. You have to work closely together with developers. They have to develop and deliver the software on the test. You have to work with the maintenance people. You have to take care of projects. How do you make sure that projects, well, align with your test automation in initiative, like changes and fixes, they need to be in there as well. Patches and updates of the software environment, of the software platform, of the software as a service you're testing. You need to take care of management. Your test automation has to fit in this context. It has to be fit for context. So you need to take care of this. You need to create something like this where test automation, well, of course, it's central for me now because I'm talking about test automation, but that test automation works closely together with the testware, with the test process, with the system on the test, with the software development process, with projects, changes, patches, fixes, re reporting, management. It has to fit in. It has to blend in. It has to become a part of it and not a separate, isolated piece of automation. That's one of the things we learned. That's one of the things you can see if you look for automation successes and failures. It has to be an integral part of the solution, of the process. So, you need to find out where you are, you need to find out where you need to be to achieve your objective in your context. So, you need to know where to go, you need to know what to do first. And, well, I learned one thing, it is good to have some kind of checklist or reference model available to do that. And, let's look at, at automation. When do we feel that automation is successful? Well, when it is well thought uh, through, when you really know that it is to the point, that it is fitting in the context, that it is achievable. And what they usually start with in software development, in automation, is kind of an architecture. You need to define a high-level structure for test automation, including a discipline of creating, maintaining, and documenting the test automation solution. You need to be able to create something like this, fit for your context. How to interpret the current testware, if available and applicable. How to talk to the software on the test. How to use the infrastructure that is required for test automation. What tools do you need? How do you create the scripts? How do you make sure that it integrates with the context? This is, the tool is in there, but it's not selected yet. It is just the architecture of the solution you're providing. That's what you need to take care of. That's, in fact, the first step that needs to be taken care of. And then, of course, you're talking about automation. So you talk about scripting. You need to create an executable sequence of automated actions to execute a test. So, like in coding, we need to find out how we define our testing components automation scripts. How do we create them? How do we manage them? Do we 
take care of version control? Do we do pair programming? Do we stuff like that? Do we do stuff like that? We need to be very careful about this. This is what we learned actually, isn't it? This is why we are in testing. We are in testing because in automation, software automation, a lot of mistakes happen. We want to prevent those mistakes in our environment. We won't be able to prevent all of them, but by creating good scripts, we will be able to prevent lots of them. And of course, standards. Test automation is software, so treat it as such. So define your standards. Preferably, use the same standards that are applicable to the software you're testing. If they're not available, help them. Maybe even work on them together. That's what you need to do. Then. And you do not only follow your own, but you follow them for the whole project. You follow them as a complete team. That's what really necessary. Of course, you need tooling. And like I said before, um, we always talk about tooling because we don't believe in one tool to rule them all. Tooling is a set of tools that provides the needed platform that enables you to run test automation. Maybe from a unit level through an end-to-end -end level. But that's what you need. You need all kinds of tools that closely work together to support your solution. And of course, if you have tooling, you need to integrate your tooling with already existing tooling. Maybe you already have defect management in place. Maybe there's already report, reporting tools available. You need to have those. You need to have those installed and you need to have them integrated to be more efficient. And of course, if you can use the same configuration management tools, you can be very more effective. You can actually link configuration management for test automation to configuration management for software. I, I've seen this in, uh, in agile environments where they actually have in the definition of done integrated test automation in the deliverables and they are actually test automation scripts are in the same repository as the software that they are delivering. So it does um, it does work actually in that sense. Now, of course, you need a test environment. Preferably, but that's my personal opinion, a separate environment, especially for end-to-end -end and acceptance testing. But that's all the hardware, and it might be virtual, but that's everything you need where you can run your tests. Preferably undisturbed, so that it's really for you, that's available for you. And of course, you need data. And that's one of the things I learned uh, actually um, uh, uh, a week ago, I guess, a colleague of mine told me this, but they had a perfect test automation set, but they always worked with clean data. You know, all the scripts were um, create new client, create this, create that, but, you know, your test data also needs to cover, especially your automated test data for regression, also need to cover those existing customers, those existing clients, those existing products in your database, because due to the fact that they were in there, have been in your system for quite a while, you need to be able to update them, you need to be able to change them, you need to be able to run the system after updates with that existing data. So that's why test data is becoming very, very important, especially for test automation as well. Of course, a strategy. A strategy on how to achieve the goal, how to implement test automation. For instance, you might be uh, in a situation where you have to automate existing end-to-end -end scenarios, ex existing end-to-end -end business test cases. That's a completely different approach than when you are testing, in fact, when you are automating tests of a system that is live and there is no test cases available. There are no test cases available. That's when you need a different strategy. So this is not something which is straightforward. This is something which you need to do and do again each time you start automating because it is different. You need to enrich existing scenarios to enable uh, automation. You need to add certain scenarios because 
to achieve more coverage, maybe you need to even create your own scenarios. And of course, this is also where you take part, uh, care of risk-based testing. Most risky, most complex parts, maybe you should automate them as soon as possible. Do the hardest part first. That's one thing as a tester I always hated. They always delivered the easy components, the easy parts from development. I always got the easy parts first. But then the truly hard stuff, the truly complex, complex uh, parts of the systems, they all were always delivered in the latest, last, final version. Maybe as test automation specialists, we should try and focus on getting them out first. Because then you are truly achieving adding value to the business, adding value to testing. Just an idea, just an idea. Um, planning and estimation, of course you need to plan and estimate your, uh, your activities, but mainly to monitor progress and regularly evaluate what you are doing. Are we still on the right track? Are we still able to achieve our objectives? Are they still realistic? And that's one of the reasons for automation strategy and planning and estimation. I, I sometimes prefer working more in, 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 uh, with a product backlog and uh, using sprints of two, maybe three weeks, where you actually pick up as a team a few of those scripts you want to automate or a few of the business scenarios you want to automate. And then each time, for each two weeks, each two weeks you can update your planning and uh, redefine um, your objectives and stuff like that. I really think that that is uh, helpful in test automation. So you deliver each two, three weeks something that adds value to your customer. So that's maybe a hint. And of course, um, maybe uh, I, I, I should have started with this one, but you need a good uh, test automation team. And maybe one of the things uh, that was on the, uh, one of the first slides uh, was, um, we are testers, and what I've seen in a lot of test automation initiatives is that we hand over tools to testers who chose testing as a profession, and we let them automate their testing activities. Now, some of them might succeed, but actually, automation is a separate skill. Some testers can do it, but most testers chose testing because they didn't like automation. So we need to get people from development in. We need to get designers in. We need to get them involved in test automation. You need to have those skills in your team if you want to be successful. You need to be like software automation. You need to be striving for continuous improvement. Like once it's up and running, some people tend not to touch it anymore. But I think you should constantly try to improve it. Maybe improve performance, maybe make it more modular, make it more reusable, but that's looking for continuous improvement. And it's not, not like uh, this Dilbert uh, uh, stating that you need 10,000 hours to practice to be great. Well, if you get people in, all kinds of people in, if you get a team together, like maybe in Agile, what they, where, where they talk about runners and upfront and, you know, all kinds, together you can create success. Together you can create a good test automation solution. So participate in the software development life cycle, please, because we are talking about software development here. So, <coughs> to uh, summarize, we ended up with those keys to success, key areas you might call them. Um, automation, in the sense of architecture, scripts, and standards, of course tooling, you need to check your environment and your data, you need to be able to integrate with the other tools that are available, and you need to have a good team that is able to create a test automation strategy and well, accurately plan and estimate the automation. Now, we need to know where we are. We need to know where we want to be. So, we'll go back to the scope and objectives. We found out about the context. And then, well, together with um, lot, uh, after a lot of discussion, we in fact came up with uh, test automation levels, as we call them. You can translate, in fact, the goal, the objective, like uh, we want to improve the quality of testing, or maybe reduce lapse time, 
reduce costs, or maybe even a combination of those, we, we found out that in fact there are three levels of test automation to be recognized. And the first one is in fact, although it might look simple, but it is maybe even the hardest one to achieve. And it is enable testing to achieve its goals. For testing, and what we want to do is we want to give a good advice, we give insight in the quality of the new release of the system, of the new software deployment and things like that. And we want to give good advice so that they can take a substantiated decision about going live, yes or no. And as test automation, the first step is to enable testing to achieve its goals. So to take out of the hands of the testers those repetitive actions, those, well, things that need to be done every time there's a new release of the software, every time there's an update of the environment, and which takes a lot of time and which takes the focus out of looking at the new parts of the system. That's the first level. Enable testing to achieve its goals. And after that, once you have established that, you might be going on to doing what I think is really necessary in certain organizations is, um, well, sorry for the wording, but it, it, it is a nice word, is mitigate more risks. Test automation, by setting it up in the right way, and this has all to do with architecture and the way you script and the way you run those scripts, you are able to test more than without automation. You, and I'm not talking about running the regression tests more often. No, you're able to test more than you are able to do without automation. So that's when you truly start adding value to testing. That's when you start mitigating more risks. And of course, in other contexts, you need to be able to become, as we call it, optimizing. Scalable test automation. Scalable to the project you're in, scalable to the fix, to the change that needs to be implemented. So, in, in other words, fit for purpose and fit for context. Not like a big, giant repository of automated tests that need to be run every time that you install something. No, scalable, fit for purpose and fit for context. Small installation, maybe with low impact, don't run everything run it selectively. Maybe even have it intelligent enough to run uh, based on the, the risks you tell uh, that there are and that need to be covered. So that's truly what is important and that's the third level. And I think for certain contexts this is necessary. And what we did was in fact create a checklist or um, a reference model or whatever you call it and we came up with all kinds of checkpoints that will help you find out where you are but also find out what you need to take care of to be sure that you are successful. So if you want to be truly contributing all those checkpoints, all those numbers need to be fulfilled then you are truly contributing to testing. Adding value, the same thing. Optimizing, the same thing. So in fact TI for Automation contains this checklist and you can use it to find out, okay, how successful am I at, at test automation? Where am I now? And what, what point am I missing? Am I missing something? And then you can, well, adjust that, look for improvements and just implement those changes and then you are truly contributing or adding value. So it looks something like this. The green is your current situation and the blue might be your target situation because your target, your objective is to really be adding value. That's the way you achieve the test automation objectives. Mitigate more risks without automation than you could do without. That's how the model, how TI for automation can in fact help you, how the checklist can help you. It's just checklists about architecture, checklists about the tooling, checklists about the data. Automation strategy, what do you have taken care of? It's based on, uh, sorry, not to say best practices again, good practices, experiences and failures in, uh, in all kinds of situations with all kinds of tooling. It's tool independent and this will truly help you uh, become successful 
add automation. Um, of course, once you start implementing it, you need an automation plan. It is automation, so you need a plan. And next to all kinds of stuff that needs to be in there, one thing is essential here. It contains potential or essential test process improvement suggestions as well as software process improvement uh, suggestions. And I always feel that you should do it in parallel to improving testing to enable testing to work better with test automation and to enable test automation to work better with the test process. Um, architecture requirements, just some examples. Um, depending on the automation level, of course, maybe you're just um, automating at AP level, API level, or at business process level, the test level. Intended use, who is going to update, create, and delete test cases in the automation environment? Is it the test automation team? Is it the operations team? You need to be able uh, to know that before you start. Um, and available and selectable tooling, because every tool has its goal. And um, talking about tooling, uh, of course the tools need to be in line with the objectives. They need to fit in the architecture in line with the available budget and in, uh, in line or aligned with the system landscape. There is a difference between automating in an SAP environment or in a .NET environment. There truly is a difference. There are tools that might be able to handle both of them, but I feel you need to look at this very carefully. And of course you have common criteria like system requirements, manuals, support, things like that, and specific criteria. Depending on the test automation le level you want to achieve, your tooling needs to be data driven. Your tooling needs to be able to um, contain recovery scenarios. But I have seen perfectly working test automation solution based on a record and playback, which is not data driven, yet it was still working perfectly and in line with the goals they wanted to achieve. Implementation, I will not uh, spend too much time on that because that is what usually everyone is talking about, how to get things automated, make it maintainable, transferable. You, of course you need the required skills, but as a test automation team you constantly need to check is this still fit for context? Is this still fit for purpose? Are we not making the same mistake we always used to do? Automate everything. Automate the easiest part first. No, stay in line with your strategy. Focus on those things. And please uh, watch the scope creep. It's terrible for test automation, especially if you're becoming successful. Everyone wants to join a winning team and wants their system to be automatically tested as well. And of course, once it's implemented, the challenge, the main challenge maybe uh, besides defining the right solution is keep it up to date. Make sure that it can handle anything that happens. Take care of changes, updates, patches and fixes. Redesign, refactor and rewrite. Why do I focus a bit on that? Because one of the things that test automation has to deal with are the same challenges testers have to deal with. We're all familiar, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not assuming something, I should not do that. Most of us are familiar with all those testing principles like the pesticide paradox. This also applies to test automation. The pesticide paradox, mind that. Keep your test automation, your test cases that are automated up to date. Keep them in line with the business processes. Business processes tend to change. Make sure that your test automation is up to date with your business processes. Make sure that it is up to date with your software development processes. So stay up and running. And what you will see is that you will see growing maturity within the context and that you can continuously contribute and add value because that is something that you need to focus on. Continuously try to add value. Keep adding value. That's also one of the things that you need to focus on. It's like spending 80% of your time on automating 20% of the scenarios might not be the best solution. Maybe some scenarios are meant to be run automatically and some scenarios are actually, well, it's impossible 
to run them automatically. You have to do that manually. Well, this is what I wanted to talk about. The roadmap to success for test automation. Take this roadmap seriously. Make sure that you've got awareness, got the commitment and buy-in continuously, not only at the beginning, but continuously. After going live, you need to have time and budget for optimizing it. Redefine your scope and go through it again. Make sure that you check every now and then where you are, are you still where you need to be, what do we need to change to start adding more value, how can we optimize, how can we make test automation scalable, fit for the new agile context, fit for lean, fit for reduce of waste, fit for your context. That's what you need to take care of. And please, please, dear test automation people, don't be tool driven, stay goal driven. That's maybe the key to success as long as you focus on the added value of test automation. So here I hand it over back to Dara, I think. Thank you for that presentation, Ruth. I'll just take back control of the screen here now. Okay, the the floor is now open to your questions. So if you have any questions, just type them into the control panel. Let me just bring your attention to our webinar archive where you can get access to this webinar as well as almost almost uh, 70 on-demand software testing webinars. And by joining our community, you can get access to software testing presentations, webinars, videos, podcasts, and eBooks. Join us next month for a webinar entitled Quality Engineering, Build It Right the First Time with Alan Woodcock. If you go onto our website, you can we register for that webinar. This year's conference is on in the Swedish Exhibition and Congress Center in Gothenburg, Sweden from the 4th to the 7th of November, so we hope to see you there. Our super early bird discount ends this Friday. So you have two days to register and receive a discount of up to 430 euros. And you can make even bigger savings when you register for a group discount where every fifth attendee goes free. So now we will have a look at some of the questions you have addressed to our presenter today, Ruth. So the first question, Ruth, I have for you today is what is the most common pitfall you have encountered in test automation? The most common pitfall in test automation. Well, in fact, it was on my previous slide, is that, um, you know, uh, a tool, as soon as you get it working, is a beautiful thing. Uh, we're currently implementing, install, uh, I'm at a customer nowadays, implementing a tool. And the thing is, once you get it implemented, uh, you get it started, you get very enthusiastic. And what you lose track of is the goal. Why are we doing this? What are we automating? What, what do we need to automate? So the, the most common pitfall is that we get too enthusiastic about the tool and all the possibilities it has so that we lose track of the goal we are actually trying to achieve. And um, sometimes it's better to deliver something that is working instead of keep on enhancing it. Same goes for software, but that's in fact the most common pitfall I've seen. The next question I have is from a Moshin Ali. If you have a software which is frequently changing, and for that you have to change the automation script, which is time consuming, what do you do? Um, well, I. I know that's that's one of the things that is uh, uh, true about test automation. Um, in the the way uh, you sometimes set it up is that as soon as there is a change to the software you're testing, you need to update your test automation. But that's one of the things that we try to cover in no not tried. I'm sorry. That's that's one of the things we we cover in um, in those checkpoints you saw in my um, in in my matrix uh, I I've seen is that. Uh, if you have frequent changes to your software, 
your test automation architecture needs to be such that it can take care of that. So it needs to be modular or object oriented. Is to the software under test to the software for test automation. And it is possible Hel to do Hello, that Root. so that maybe a minor change adding a drop box. Yeah. I sorry for interrupting sorry. you there. I think there was just a slight uh, error or interruption there in the audio. If you wouldn't mind just repeating that question. Ooh. I would repeat it. So frequent changes to the software usually implies frequent changes to the um, to the test automation solution. We've taken care of that in the model uh, by um, at a higher level um, for the architecture and the way your scripts are developed. We we then start working in a more object oriented or in a more uh, library based way, so that impacts of software changes uh, is minimized um, uh, due to that up, uh, the way test automation is set up. So you need to truly take care of your architecture and the way you are scripting your tests to minimize the impact of frequent software changes. So that actually means it takes a bit more time to get up and running with automation, but it saves you loads of time if you have a lot of updates on your software. The next question, I'm sorry, the next question I have there is from Dakesh Shah. What does the one, two, three, four mean in the checklist? It doesn't really mean that much. It means just that for a certain level, there are three questions, three checkpoints. So for each key area, for um, adding value, for instance, there are four checkpoints. That's all. Doesn't mean anything else. I could have given them uh, colors, I could have given them um, uh, letters or something like that. It doesn't mean anything else than that each number represents one checkpoint. The next question is from uh, David Back. How much attention do you pay to testing the automated tests themselves? Haha, <laughs> that's a very good, good question. Thank you for asking that. Yes. We spend a lot of time uh, on that. That's First of all, that's part of your automation strategy at the first level already. If you want to have a good implementation of your automation, you need to spend time on testing your automation. And next to that, it's in our coding standards and it is in our scripting, the way we script. Um, there are all kinds of checkpoints that actually tell you about version control, uh, how to test uh, your test scenarios, automated test scenarios and that. They are in the model, of course. Uh, I cannot deliver, as a, as, a, as a passionate software tester, I cannot deliver untested software. That could not be in a model I'm talking about. I'm sorry. So, it is covered in there. The next question is from Jamie Bowditch. How do, uh, do you find sometimes software is developed quicker than you can write the automated tests? If so, how do you cope with this? Hmm. Well, then I come back to the, well, uh, yes, in the beginning, if you're, let's suppose there is already software development taking place and you're stepping in with test automation, I can assure you software development will be quicker than test automation. But once your test automation solution is implemented, and in that kind of context, I would go for the second level, for the one that is adding value. At that point in time, you will be able to keep up with software development. And I've seen some solutions for that. Um, you can also involve software development in test automation. You don't have to do the automation yourself all the time. You could get software development involved in automating your tests as well, so that it will be a cooperative or team uh, responsibility to deliver not only working software, but also working test automation software. And although this might sound agile or scrum or whatever, it is in that context, it's common, but you can do this in any other um, software development lifecycle as well. I've, 
I truly uh, feel that once you're at that level of test automation, you need to be um, to be able to get there and take care of uh, what I call always manage management expectations. As soon as you can tell them this is the case, and within three months we will be up there, I think you'll be fine. The next question is from Mohinder Koshla. Are your experiences with vendor tools or open source tools such as Selenium? Well, um, my, our experiences, I'm not only talking about my experiences, our experiences are with almost any uh, uh, tool available. Uh, we have some very good implementations um, working together with customers using Selenium, uh, even IDE's uh, web driver, um, um, also some own homemade tools to, uh, to uh, automatically test uh, COBOL uh, environments and we've been working with um, uh, commercial tools uh, like Rational or uh, like, uh, well nowadays it's called ALM and uh, Quality Center from HP and Mercury. So, like I said, the tooling is not the central point. They're part of the solution. So we can do this with almost any tool. As long as the tool meets the criteria we set for it. Okay, we'll take Next. one last question for you yeah. there. Okay, the no, last oh, looking, looking at the time, yeah. yeah. We'll take one last question. Um, yeah. the, this question is, can we be assured that the intended scope is fully covered by the automation test and no need to inject a bit of manual testing in that area? Um, I don't believe that um, automating, automated testing can take over manual testing. There is always need for manual intervention. There's always need for additional manual testing. Um, an automatic tool is software running some logic, some data, and, and if it's well thought of, it can take care of a lot. But there are always business people or developers or testers needed to analyze the results, to analyze if something happens, what has happened. And there is always a need for some additional manual testing. So, if your scope is, for instance, the regression test of your SAP implementation, um, I'm sorry to tell you, you will always have to do some manual regression testing in that area. So, you will never be able to cover 100%. You will be able to cover maybe 80, maybe sometimes 90%, but not more than that. Okay, <clears throat> well we've gone over the hour mark there now, so we're just going to finish the webinar. And I'd like to thank Rude for doing today's webinar. And I'd also like to just remind you once again that this Friday is the closing day for our Super Early Bird discount. The webinar is now over. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.